Hey, Evan. Yeah? I was just thinking we should do a collaboration. Oh, sure. What do you have in mind? This. Hello, and welcome to Small Soldier. Today, I'll be doing a collaboration series with me, Panzermeister36. It's all coming up right now. Hello everyone and welcome back to Small Soldier. This video is a two-part collaboration with Evan from Panzermeister 36. We're both building T-34 122s. I'm presenting the post-war Egyptian model and Evan is doing a World War II variant. Part 1 will include tips and techniques on the builds and part 2, which will be a future video, will consist of painting and weathering demonstrations. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing, hit the bell notification, give me a thumbs up, and share this video with someone you love, or like. Now get ready for... Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well. Welcome to my first, and definitely not my last, armor build, here on Small Soldier. As you can see, I'm using the Tamiya Sharp Nose Sprue Cutters to remove the parts off the sprue trees. These sprue cutters are excellent for getting into tight spaces, and really help prevent the damages to plastic parts. Unless I know the parts are definitely not going to be seen, I always clean off all the sprue gates and uh, mold seams that go around all the parts. You know, if you don't do that, inevitably something's going to show up and you're going to see a seam line, especially when you're putting your stuff into model shows and it's being judged. These are the things that judges look for, so just always remember to clean all the parts up. I always leave just a little tab of plastic on the parts as I'm cutting them off the trees. This just ensures a clean cut and that you can clean the rest off with your knife or a file. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll end up with a possible void in the plastic where the, the sprue gate has broken out and then you're just going to have to fill it again. I usually start with a hobby blade to remove the seam line and then after that I'll finish it off with a medium and then use a buffing sanding pad after just to finish things off. All the parts are cleaned up and ready to go for the lower chassis assemblies. You mainly will see me using Tamiya Extra Thin for the most part on my builds. I do use CA glue as well and sometimes the white bottled plastic cement but for the most part I rely on Tamiya Extra Thin. I kind of pooch this part of the assembly. The first and second spring housings need to be reversed and if you don't do that the turret doesn't fit. I fixed it later but just be aware of that when you're building this part. One of the bonuses of this kit is that all the parts fit really well. They're excellently engineered and you barely have a swipe of feller here and there, but for the most part things are pretty tight. There's a few things later on you'll see that kind of annoyed me, but for the most part it, uh, it worked out really well.
The suspension arms and drive housings were fairly straightforward. And as you can see, they pretty much built themselves. Yes, it's time for the fun with road wheels. Oh, the joy. We all love putting together road wheels so much. One after the other, scraping all the seams off. There's nothing I enjoy more. Actually, these weren't bad at all. They cleaned up pretty quick. There wasn't a lot of cleanup to them and uh, they came out fairly well in the end. Here's a little trick some of you may or may not know. Just uh, take your road wheels off and uh, stick them on to your Dremel tool, tighten them up and you can take a sanding stick, turn it on and you can clean those uh, mold seams off, off the road wheels really quick. So on the rubber portion is, is where you're cleaning these up but uh, it, it goes fairly quick. You just take a a medium or a heavy uh, sanding pad and then just use a buffing sanding pad and you'll find they come up real nice and it's a lot quicker than doing it by hand and what's a road wheel without a little damage to it uh, it'll just give your uh, road wheels a little more realism and accuracy if you uh, take some chunks out of the rubber here and there. Don't go nuts uh, on every road wheel, but uh, maybe I went a little too far on this one, but uh, I didn't do them all this way, so y you want to kind of keep it random if you can. Ah yes, the old hairspray treatment. Not just for your granny's hair anymore. Anyway, I uh, usually put a couple light coats on each part. The amount of hairspray you put on will determine the size of your chips. So the more hairspray you put on, the larger the chips you'll get. And vice versa. I like to build the coats up slowly and lightly and depending on what kind of effect you're going for uh, the less paint you put on the easier the chips will be to remove the more paint you put on uh, you'll have to be a little more aggressive on that paint to uh, get those chips to start happening I know I did say that uh, the painting process would be in part two, but I kind of had to do the lower chassis before I could go any further with the build, so that's why I've added this portion to the build part of the video. Now the base color I used here was an olive drab spray rattle spray can and I just uh, laid that in first to imply that the T-34 had been painted green at one time and now the Egyptians have repainted it. That's the color you'll see coming through on the chips and scratches. Now whether this is a historically accurate depiction of what might have been painted underneath the sand color. I'm not really sure. There are, no, there are no known photographs that I've seen in all my research showing um, what these looked like in a combat situation. So I'm just doing this off what I think it would look like. Uh, 
Now, hairspray chipping is something that's been around for a while. Some of you may know how to do it, but for those of you that don't or haven't seen this done before, what you're doing is laying on a bead of water over top of the layer of paint that you want to chip. And depending on how much water you put on will determine how much paint comes off. So go easy at it at first and then uh, kind of go subtly at it because if you add too much water and you go to remove an area that you may not want to remove that much paint off. So add your water, start removing with your stiff brush or toothpick or whatever you're using and you should come up with some fairly realistic looking chips. Of course practice makes perfect so you may want to try this technique on something you don't care about first then when you feel confident enough throw down with one of your good projects. Actually what you can do is from uh, what you see here you can practice on the bottom of the tank if it's not going to be visible use that as your practice pad and when you feel your chips are looking good enough uh, move it up to the areas that you're going to see a lot of what I'm doing here will get covered up by other weathering procedures along the way so don't get too hung up with your chips being too big or too small or maybe you did something that you didn't quite like, chances are you can probably remove those later in a different procedure. I really appreciate the way they engineered these road wheels sure made the painting procedure a lot easier with uh, not having to mask off the rubber or paint it by hand. Although there were a few fit issues here and there. Uh, yeah, there were a couple that were a bit of a bear, but that just had to do with the amount of paint I think that was on them. So, uh, yeah, not too bad. tracks were some of the nicest parts in the kit, uh, not a lot of cleanup and they fit really well. This is the way I build my Lincoln Link tracks. Uh, you may have your own procedure or may find something that works better for you this is just the way I do it so uh, I just lay out the, the larger link of track and then just add each track link in section uh, adding the glue as I go and then once all those links are built for the bottom or the top half you let that sit for a few minutes and then you're going to bend the track around the road wheels and form them that way and unfortunately I didn't film that part but you'll see later on in the build uh, the actual formed track so uh, I'll have to do that in another video at some point this may seem like a lot of work by looking at it and it takes a little time but really it's not that hard just takes a little patience. Once you get the parts cleaned up it goes fairly quick. You'd be surprised how quick this part of the build actually goes once you get a rhythm happening.
Once I establish how many track links are needed for the top or bottom run, I will add one more uh, squirt of glue on each track section just before I, I uh, bend them up and around just to make sure they all stick together and don't fall apart. It's also a good idea to have some sort of absorbent uh, paper towel or something underneath. Uh, don't do it on a plastic mat or something that the tracks actually will melt to. Uh, I've done that and learned that the hard way and it just becomes a big mess. So here you see the tracks are formed and ready to paint. This will make your life a lot easier in the painting procedure. I didn't add much for aftermarket to this kit. Most of it is built out of the box. I did add though these Adler machine guns. They're just much nicer looking and um, you can blacken them with the blackening solution as well. They just looked a lot better than the plastic parts. If you're interested in seeing more about Photo Etch and how to work with it, check the upper right corner after this video is over and uh, it'll direct you to a video all about Photo Etch. I prefer to sand the front and the back of my Photo Etch before I install it. It just helps things adhere a little better as far as paint and glue goes. And when you use the blackening solution, it helps the blackening solution get into the brass a little easier. Sometimes you'll see at a model show or a model on a shelf the brass showing through on a paint job. Well by blackening the photo etch uh, this just helps hide that a little bit if paint does get scratched on a piece of photo etch well you're gonna see black underneath as opposed to uh, shiny brass. That's the reason why I do it. Just peace of mind. Magic. Using a brush to agitate the solution into the brass helps it get into all the nooks and crannies just to ensure that there's no uh, shiny brass showing up after. And here you see the results of the blackening solution. And you're going to uh, want to get a pot of clear water after or clean water and just lay those pieces into the water to uh, stop the solution from activating. And then just dry them off with a uh, paper towel and they're good to go. When I'm adding parts to the model, I often will glue from the inside if I can. This just prevents any kind of damages to the outside of the plastic. Although I still will add a bead of glue around things just to secure things up. It's always a good idea to uh, try and glue from the inside as much as possible. This is a great product for making simple molds. It's essentially like any kind of epoxy putty. You just mix two parts together, press your part into the rubber, let it dry, and then pour your mold. These Molotow chrome pens work excellent for creating chrome surfaces. I would just suggest uh, using it only in areas where you're not going to be touching it because it uh, really doesn't stand up to that kind of uh, treatment. But great for the inside of headlights and that type of thing. And another great tool I found recently are these uh, Bondek 
glue pens. Not such a great glue, but it works great for making clear parts or anything like that. And it cures up with a UV light, so it stays liquid until you hit it with the UV light. And this is the final step, a little feature on top. We'll just give it that extra little bit of gloss. I used a bit of uh, Humbrol Clear Fix to glue the headlight lens in. Uh, you can use any kind of white glue or anything like that. Anything that dries clear essentially. And I'm sure you'll agree by seeing this, you'll see what a nice looking lens that makes. The following steps were pretty straightforward. Everything fit perfectly. I didn't have any issues. A uh, little bit of cleanup, like I said, on some of the plastic, and uh, everything just fit together like a puzzle. As far as the construction of everything, I would uh, highly recommend this kit. I would say it's very similar to a Tamiya build, yet with maybe a little bit more finesse in the detailing. Always cut on a hard surface when you're cutting photo etch off the tree. It just prevents uh, parts from getting damaged or bent. This next part coming up, I just wanted to mention not to put this infantry call button on like it says in the instructions. That's wrong. Uh, it's not supposed to be there. So just wanted to let you know ahead of time. Don't do it, Len. Here's an old school trick for creating dents in plastic. Just take a uh, motor tool with a grit typed uh, bit on the end and grind out some denty looking shapes. And once you get those uh, shapes to where you want them, you want to put uh, a felt tip in the end or a soft tip of some kind and soften all those edges out. Uh, smooth them out so they look more like uh, a dent as opposed to a, a grind in plastic. At this point I take a little steel wool and buff things up and that'll uh, get all those dents really smooth. For finer dent work I like to use a file. You can just get in and make smaller impressions in the plastic than you would with a larger bit and then once you get those to where you like them go in and just buff those up with a sanding stick or some more steel wool Another tool I use a lot when working with photo etch is this brass assist set. It consists of some steel rods and wooden dowels and you use those in the channels like I showed you here uh, to roll the photo etch and get it to conform around round or oblong shapes. Uh, it works really well.
and a little bit of CA glue just to hold things down. The finished pieces. You can see how round those straps are. So that assist tool really helps to make that happen. The exhausts were two halves, so uh, a little bit of filling was needed there, but I figured the hollow wasn't quite what I wanted it to be, so I just took the Dremel tool and made that a little deeper and made the edges of the, the pipe thinner. So I'm just taking a, a reaming tool here and just thinning that out a little bit and getting a better profile. And then a finer bit here just to dig in a little deeper. I also added a weld bead down the center of it because the T-34s did have that weld seam present. I often use this vulcanized piece of material. It's great for uh, using as a backer for rolling out pieces that need to be curved and as you can see that worked out really well right there. This is an easy way of creating dents in boxes or fenders. Actually, this is the way I dented the fenders on the T-34. I use a series of uh, ball rollers or uh, burnishers, I guess you'd call them, and uh, just press into the plastic again on this vulcanized piece of material here. Just pushing dents into logical places where things might get bashed up. And then once, uh, once things are pushed into where I think they look pretty good I will go in and sand things and use steel wool and, and I even use a, a hard needle to uh, push in impressions as well. Here I'm scribing back in lost detail that I mashed up when I was squishing in the plastic so any undercuts underneath the box edges or around buckles that kind of thing I'll go in and just clean those up a bit and create a little more 3D impression here's that needle I was talking about I'll use that to uh, smooth things out uh, to get them a little more uniform overall And here's a quick overview of everything that's been added. All the dents in the boxes and the fuel cells and everything on the fenders. And now it's time for probably the most interesting part of the kit in my opinion the turret. There's a lot of great detail on the inside of the turret which unfortunately won't be seen. Uh, the only thing that really did annoy me was this. Why did they have to do this? Sorry for the jump scare there. No need to worry though, I'll fix this up in a jiffy. Who doesn't like a little shake and bake? Voila! I think this just might be my masterpiece. Huh. 
Yeah, if only it was that easy. No, it's not a Tamiya kit, or it's not, uh, you know, One Piece Barrel Dragon kit, unfortunately. It does require a little bit of work, and I'm going to show you exactly what I did right now. So once the two halves are glued together, I sand the crap out of them, basically to get that line even. And you can see as I'm sanding, I'm always turning the barrel. And you can see here, even though I've done that, there's still that nasty seam right there. And I'm going to show you how to fix that up. Take one of these flexi files. They're excellent for uh, curved surfaces and barrels or round, round things like that. And you just roll the plastic back and forth while running that flexi file over top of that joint. And this will prevent uh, flat spots from happening if you were to just use a piece of sandpaper or something. Uh, these are a great little tool for anything that you need to keep round. As you can see, I switched to a fine grit now, or a polishing grit, and I'll just keep working that barrel and keep turning it, and eventually it, I can get it looking pretty much like a metal barrel without purchasing a metal barrel. It just takes a bit of work and uh, patience. You may have noticed that I'm using a thinner sanding stick here. These are ones I make myself. I just take an old sanding stick that's wearing out a bit and I'll trim them all down. Uh, it's quite handy to have different varieties of uh, thicknesses for uh, sanding sticks and it's quite easy to make them yourself. Once I feel I've got the uh, barrel cleaned up enough, I like to give it a final polish just to help with the final procedure, which will be coming up next. Here I'm going to be using uh, Mr. Surfacer 500, and this will serve uh, as a bit of a primer just to show if there's any imperfections left on the barrel, if there's any deep seams or anything that needs to be taken care of. This will uh, make that show up. I'll usually lay in one coat of the Mr. Surfacer and then go back in and add a second coat. This serves to fill any gaps or other voids that may still be present. And once I get a nice even finish over the whole barrel, I go in and give it one final polish. This is a bit of a time-consuming process to do it this way, but in my opinion it's the only way to really uh, effectively remove any kind of mold line or any kind of parting line that you might see under a layer of paint. And even yet I've found after doing all this sometimes there's still a ghost line that you have to clean up after all said and done so do it once do it right and you should come out with good results
Oops, I stand corrected. There is still one procedure left to do, and that is wet dry sanding. That's right, wet dry sanding. Everybody knows that wet dry sanding will uh, polish the piece you're working on and will feather out any kind of edges on the, the seam line that you filled or any kind of primer. So yeah, wet dry sand is your best bet for a final, final finish. And if you're wondering what the big yellow thing is in the background, it is a rubber block and it's used for cleaning off files or sponge pads or any sanding kind of materials. It just keeps everything nice and clean and it works really good. So this was another bit of a beef I had with the kit. If you look at the instruction sheet there, you'll see that this piece is molded as one piece and it's hollow all the way through. So I'm not understanding what and... <laughs> they did this. And now that the barrel's all cleaned up, I can go ahead and finish up with the final building procedures on the gun. And you can see there I actually do use the white bottled Tamiya glue from time to time. And the only difference is the thickness in the glue. The white is thicker and the green is thinner. And here you can see I've decided to paint the inside of the muzzle brake and the inside of the end of the gun barrel with a dark black gray just so that hides the plastic on the inside once it's painted. As you can see, I'm just drilling some pilot holes here for a, ha a grab handle that I actually broke. One of the plastic ones broke, so I just had to make it out of metal. And this is the procedure I use for doing that. It's a tool called the grab handler and basically you clamp the, your rod in there and you just bend the two pieces down to the width you want and presto instant grab handle yeah I really like this tool for doing grab handles it makes things quite accurate and bends them to uh, perfect shape I'm just adding all the final details to the top of the turret I also really like the fact that the turret's molded in one piece. That was an impressive piece of engineering when you really look at it. Now this part here I'm gluing on next. You might want to leave that to the end. I did end up snapping off that little piece of plastic on the top and replacing it with a piece of brass later. It just kind of gets in the way. And again, I just wanted to emphasize the fit and finish on the uh, engineering of this kit. It's just fantastic. It's, it went together so easy. There was no fighting anything and, you know, big gaps here and there, or parts that didn't fit. Uh, just an outstanding overall fit of the entire kit. I was super, super happy with it. Now this uh, uh, mantlet cover here is something I thought would be more of a problem than it actually was. It fit in pretty good, but it had to be persuaded with a lot of super glue, to be honest, from the back, or CA glue. Uh, so it was a lot of fiddling just to make it fit into that front piece snugly. But once it was in there, it was just a matter of taking this here and just with a bit of pressure, and it tells you this in the instructions, you just kind of fiddle with it a bit and then a good shove and the whole thing just fits through perfect great fit again. And again I'm uh, gluing from the inside, just especially with the, the turret here I don't want anything to seep out too much. And uh, the glue I'm actually using here is called Ambroid Pro Weld and it dries really quick. It's sort of like the new Tamiya glue that's come out, the fast drying stuff basically the same kind of thing um, and it works really fast so you have to make sure your parts are mated together properly
This is another way of creating uh, realistic looking weld beads. You just take Mr. Surfacer and build it up around the part you want to create a, a weld seam on. It may take three or four coats to build that up and then after it's dried for a bit I just take a sharpened uh, toothpick and poke around at it, clean it up a bit and you can texturing it basically and you get a pretty convincing weld bead. I forgot to mention that I'm dipping the toothpick into Tamiya lacquer thinner. That just helps keep the dried putty fluid as you're pushing it around and also helps to clean up unwanted areas of putty that uh, you want to clean up in between the sections of the weld beads you're creating. Another advantage of using Mr. Surfacer or uh, something like a Tamiya putty is the ability to clean off the areas you've filled with with Tamiya lacquer thinner again on a Q-tip. You just moisten the Q-tip up and run that over the areas that you filled and you basically clean off everything without having to sand and that will just leave a nice bead of uh, the filler in the joint that you want to leave it in. It's a super useful technique, I use it all the time. And another useful uh, advantage of using Mr. Surfacer is for creating cast texture. Here I'm just replacing the cast texture that was lost when I had to sand that joint out. So I'm just building up layers of the Mr. Surfacer over the joint to hide it and then blending in the texturing to the rest of the textured area. And then just give it a final sand just to kind of take the high edges down from the texturing that you've created. Thanks everybody for sticking around. Stay tuned for part two in our collaboration series where I'll be painting and weathering the Egyptian T-34-122. Hope to see you all soon. Take care. Bye bye now.